Hello, and welcome back to our Rockhurst University podcast, Upon This Rock. Today, we are very, very honored to have our student senate president with us, Brianna. Brianna, yes, yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll introduce our special guest in Kansas City today. Yes, um, like you said, I'm a senior attending Rockhurst University. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and I majoring in bioethics and physics of medicine. So I'm very excited for the road that lies ahead of me, and I'm very grateful to be here on today. And we're both grateful to uh, welcome David Brooks back to Kansas City. Uh, welcome to you, David. Good Thanks to be back here. And I'm, yeah. Brianna, I'm very intimidated by your majors already. <laughs> yeah, isn't she smart? <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Uh, but, uh, David uh, grew up, uh, born in Canada, right? But uh, grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in New York City, where yeah. my family's really from, five generations in one neighborhood in Lower Manhattan. Oh, that's fabulous. And then you went to college in Chicago. You were Chicago. Yeah. Um, it sort of formed me. I didn't say, I wouldn't say I had a lot of fun there. The famous thing about my <laughs> school is where fun goes to die. But what, I learned a lot. Where is Brianna? <laughs> I mean, I don't really know about Rockers. No, but... I'm sure Rockers <laughs> is very different. Well, there are a lot of things that we learn on the college level and a lot of things that we hope will carry us on through the rest of our lives. And sometimes there are some good things that you can refer back to and say, boy, I'm glad I got that in my college years. Yeah. And then there's some other things that we might say, I wish I had gotten that 40 years ago, but well, uh, here I'm we are. I'm very today. proud of my alma mater. I feel more affected by it now mm -hmm. than I did when I graduated. Well, I bet they're very proud of you. You think of all that you've accomplished and you packed into your, your life already from a columnist and author and writing long things and short things. Uh, and then, of course, a teacher, uh, you know, yes. lo loves uh, energized by colleges <laughs> and college campuses and college students. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Brianna and you guys uh, talk about the value of uh, being a, a student and then uh, in the future, yes. how you can look back and how we want to impact students to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You talked a little bit about how much your alma mater has affected you greatly in the work that you do today. So can you just talk a little bit about what are like some few key takeaways that you've gained from that experience going to college and how it has impacted your life greatly on today? Yeah, I would say first at college, you, your college is supposed to give you new things to love. Mm -hmm. So you find a subject to love, a group of friends to love, um, maybe a sport or a hobby or an activity. <laughs> and so my college definitely did that. I also, my professors, I don't remember a lot of what they taught me, but I remember how impressive they seemed to me. They really took books really seriously. And there's a phrase saying, if you catch fire with enthusiasm, People will come for miles to watch you burn. And my professors had that level of enthusiasm. So uh, I learned, you know, I, it's hard once you've read the great books in a serious way, the way I did, it's hard to settle for um, Kool-Aid, the light stuff, the light beer. That's so amazing. I, I would also say one thing I learned, which I didn't learn, but I've learned as a professor, is I, I tell students, um, the next five years after you graduate are going to be rough. <laughs> uh, up to your life so far, it's been station to station. People are telling you next test, next thing to apply for. But when you finish your schooling at whatever level, there are no more stations. There's nobody telling you what to do. And you got to figure it out. And there are going to be bad bosses and bad breakups. <laughs> and so I always say overinvest in your friendships now because you'll need them <laughs> in the next five years. I believe that's great advice, especially as someone who will be graduating in a little over a month. I definitely appreciate that advice. Well, one of the things that I was recently thinking about on the way here is that on one of your talks, you talked about um, thinking about as a person in our virtues, living life according to your eulogy or leaving, living life according to your resume. And so as a young professional, like we're early on in our careers and what we always hear is get the career, get the job, get the money, and then everything else will come after that. So how do you feel about that um, as a young professional try to navigate um, advancing in your career, but then also leaving a lasting impact on those around you. Yeah, well, I disagree. <laughs> those are the pressures of our society, but yes. I disagree. Uh, and the, the book uh, I wrote called The Road to Character was said, that there's some virtues that'll make you good as an accountant or a doctor or whatever you're, you're gonna be. Um, and there's some virtues they'll, they'll say about you after you're dead, whether you're honest, courageous, capable of great love. And we all know the second virtues are more important. Uh, who you are inside is more important than what you've achieved. Uh, and I would say, first of all, those virtues help you achieve because most people want to work with somebody who's trustworthy <laughs> and they want to work with somebody who understands and can see others deeply. And that's the stuff you've learned from novels, from friendships, from relationships. And I will say that I achieved way more career success than I ever thought I would. Uh, and I can tell you when I got to a high level, it wasn't, wasn't that great. <laughs> it was, it was okay. It, it meant I wasn't a failure. But it didn't give me much positive uh, joy. 
And so the things that give you joy are the, the friendships and the love and yes. all the things that, uh, the Bible talks about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Someone. terrific. Hey, uh, David, you know, I, I think as sometimes in the Catholic university, we look at our own mission and our own uh, desires as a Jesuit university and uh, founded by Ignatius of Loyola. And he right. would speak about going down one path and then uh, looking at two paths. He would say the two standards that we might follow. And one of them seems very, very attractive. And it might be more like first half of life, uh, the things right. that uh, are the, the call to us. It's about success. It's about the uh, ego-driven life. But he, he realized that those kind of things didn't sustain him in the long run. You know, he wanted to be a soldier. He wanted to be a ladies' man. He wanted to be a courtier. He wanted to be kind of famous. Look, look at me. Uh, but he realized those things didn't really get him anywhere. And then when he had his uh, cannonball experience, we, we, we call it, yeah, <laughs> literally a cannonball hitting his leg. He hobbled away and he had to recuperate and he found things that were more sustaining and he called it uh, desolation and consolation. Uh, but uh, we might call it that second mountain or we yeah. might call it that second stage of life as some of our uh, Catholic theologians uh, do. You know, the first half of life is about accumulating things. What do we want to accumulate? A career of uh, certain things that make us look good. But then we get to some point at some time. And then we say, this may not be the most important thing. There's something better than success and accumulation. And then we start disseminating things, downsizing, giving away, passing on wisdom, experience of years. And you speak to that so beautifully. Do you mind for our listeners just saying a little bit about that first yeah. half and second mountain? Well, the, the first mountain is the, well, we, you know, as you say, getting a career in second mountain is really, it's not outward, it's inward. It's not acquiring and climbing up. It's, it's becoming deeper and becoming better. And Ignatius had the the ultimate experience because getting a cannonball in your leg is it's going to wake you up and um, get to get you to change your values. But uh, I, I think I I wouldn't want to give young people a pass and say my moral formation is something I'll worry about when I'm forty five. Uh, you know, my wife uh, went to a very fine Christian college, not a Catholic one, but uh, called Wheaton in Illinois, and um, I always say she had her second mountain first. <laughs> And so she de- developed um, some spiritual depths, had a faith experience when she was, I guess, 16 or 17. Uh, and it's admirable. Uh, and the fruit of the Spirit flows out of her, I would say. And you find that, that in all, people of all ages. And if you're waiting to, if you're going to say, I'm going to be a grubby, grubby money grabber until I'm 45, uh, well, you're going to have a crack. <laughs> And so, uh, it won't be a cannonball. It'll be, it won't be as physical, but it'll feel just as bad. Right. So David, do you think that universities today dealing with 18 and 22 year olds can have that kind of an impact, whether it's Wheaton or or Rockhurst or, um, uh, the schools that can help young people to understand as our our former president used to say, one foot in the classroom, but one foot out in the streets, Uh, be living what, what, what we're learning. Yeah. And uh, be uh, t- true leaders. Do you, do you think uh, young people, and Brianna, you may want to chime in on this, are at that point normally, or is, is your wife uh, kind of an anomaly? Or Pope yeah. Francis had an experience when he was 17, and it really called him to go to that second mountain. So sometimes right. some people have it. I don't think I had it. I was pretty yeah. immature. Yeah, I had it at a secular school where we just read a certain philosophical books, and my uh, professors thought, if you read these books, you will learn how to live well. And so that was, that. Yeah, I think people generally need to be formed either by parents, by friends or family. And the nice thing about an Ignatian school is that he gave us a method for moral formation, how you create better people. And, um, to me, moral formation is about three simple things. The first is finding a purpose in life. What's the ultimate aim your, what's the ultimate goal you're aiming at. And for Catholics, it's the life of Jesus. It's about how do you restrain your natural selfishness? And third, it's about how do you be considerate to people in the normal activities of life? If you're at a party and somebody's left out, how do you like include them? Uh, how do you break up with somebody without crushing their hearts? These are not complicated. These are everyday things, but they're skills. You have to learn them and you have to see them modeled. Uh, and uh, I once wrote a column about how hard it is to um, teach moral morality in a classroom. And I got an email from a veterinarian out in Ohio, Oregon, I guess. And he said, uh, never forget the, what a wise person says is the least of that which they give. What gets measured is their behavior in its smallest particulars. Never forget the message is the person. So whether it's a teacher or a friend, it's the way you are that radiates a standard of behavior. And when I first read that, Pope Francis had actually just come into 
uh, the papacy. And I, I, the world was falling in love with the guy. And I thought, yeah, the message is the person. There are a lot of people who are not Catholics, don't believe in Catholic belief, but they know that a guy who acts like Jesus is going to be admirable. Yeah. Brown, do you believe that the student body here and, and your peers, that they can tap into a logic and reason and critical thinking and reflective thought, and that they can tap into this whole notion about things that are greater than uh, my career yeah. and, and my uh, immediate future? Absolutely. One of the things that I feel like, and I'm so glad that you talked about purpose. I know for me coming into um, Rockhurst University, when I was able to take hold of my passion and understand like what am I, what I am passionate about and the impact that I want to leave on those around me, the way that in which I carried out my life changed significantly. And I think that's where that emotional ch intelligence come into play, where you're having your self-awareness and consciousness of oneself, but then you're also conscious of those that are around you. So I definitely believe that students have that opportunity. We see student leaders doing so many things on campus, whether it's organization, events, our student government, and so forth. And so you see um, them taking their ideas and their creativity and turning it into action. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. I know one of the things that I always love to say, and I was telling um, Fowler about this on the way here, is that I'm in the stage in my life where I'm chasing my impact. I'm not chasing the title. And I think when you're chasing your impact and that's you're driven through that titles, accolades, that's not that's not important. That's not in your, um, I guess, your priority. What, what made you interested in bioethics or medical? Mm -hmm. ethics? Absolutely. So I'm I want to go into the healthcare system. I've always loved science. And so my master's will actually be in public health with a concentration in health equity. And so one of the main things that I wanted to do is to help bridge the gap between marginalized communities and the healthcare system. Because um, in the past, we've seen so many histories of distrust. And so now we're trying to assess, like, what are ways in which we can mend that trust and making sure that we do that through love, understanding that um, they're human, um, understanding their emotions, but then also creating concrete policies and initiatives so that we can help uplift those um, otherwise disadvantaged groups. Fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. David, I know we're running out of time. We don't have a lot of time here, but I want to also ask if you wouldn't mind commenting on how you were able to rise above some of the polarizations that exist in our society and our nation in particular, and maybe to some degree um, in, in our churches. I mean, you have a vast experience in Judaism and in Christianity. Uh, you, you certainly, I don't think anybody can pin you down politically, though there might, you know, might be some ways that you self-describe. But, but you're able to, to, to rise above, and I know that's not uh, easy in our world, but uh, yeah. you, you become a, a real icon for those who want to be able to see both sides of things. Yeah. I would say two things. One, I happen to have a political philosophy that sort of puts me not quite at home in either party. And so my hero is Alexander Hamilton, and he said we should use government in limited but energetic ways to help young men and women to rise and succeed. And it's not... As big government as the Democrats are, it's not as libertarian as the Republicans are. It's a tradition that's sort of in the middle there. And then the second thing is, I'm a paid journalist. So I, I have a travel budget and I just travel. And, and a lot of weeks I'm in three states every week. And if you're in one week, you're in a very conservative part of Nebraska. Uh, last week I was in a very conservative part of Georgia. And then in between, I'll be in a very progressive part of California. And he just, the people are so ill-informed about each other. Uh, and, and they're not who they, if you get your, frankly, if you get your, a lot of your information through the media, you don't get the complexity of what's out there. Uh, and if you sit down at a diner and interview people like I do for a living, it just looks every, it's hard to hate people up close. That's well said. And you are also genuinely interested in people. That makes a difference. Yeah, I'm paid to be interested, but I hope I'm naturally interested. <laughs> I hope so, too. You know, I think about um, Irma Bombeck. This might be a strange thing to say, but, you know, she was kind of considered the patron saint of American housewives. And part of it was her wit and her wisdom and her um, humor and her honor that she brought to people inside the home. You kind of do that for people outside of the home as they're looking at uh, business and education and politics. And try to bring those things that are so important to you, good character, virtue, yeah. and uh, help people to see things uh, from a, a different view, kind of the way that um, Mrs. Bombeck did. Yeah. Well, you know, I, one of the things I started a program called Weave, which is to take local community 
builders uh, all over in neighborhoods all around the country and sort of lift them up and tell their story and help them tell their own story. And so we would go into a town and say, who's trusted here in a neighborhood? And whether it was the South side of Chicago or New Orleans or, or, uh, central Ohio, um, every community you would say who's trusted here and they would immediately tell you. And those were the persons who's organizing the community. And I learned that the community, the neighborhoods don't need outside information. The neighborhood knows what it needs to do. It just sometimes needs some, aff some resources and things like that, but you can generally trust the community to, to know its own problems best and to know its own solutions best. You know, one of the things that Rockridge University is looking at, Brianna, we talked about this just briefly, is the uh, core curriculum. You know, the uh, yeah. Jesuit Catholic <laughs> University just have so many hours of philosophy, so many hours of theology. I think I was required 15 of both when I was a student. And it's not so much now anymore, but we're trying to find out our identity and, and what it is that we're really wanting to be. And uh, I, I'd be curious, I'd even say, if you have any advice for universities like ours, if you're seeking that kind of identity, I mean, I, I think in one sense, we know that um, we don't always uh, maybe uh, n n name it so well, but do you, do you have any comments on that, Priyana? Yeah, I would definitely say I see the transition, of course, and what I do appreciate with um, Rockhurst especially is that they reevaluate that core to see like, is this working? Is this what students want and is it aiding them in their future? And so I know for me coming in as a first year student, my core curriculums were a minimum of two classes, so six credit hours. And so something I was telling Fowler was that I've noticed that I was able to gain the most um, connection with what I want to go into with my career oh, yeah. and um, further passion through the upper division courses. So it's like you have to learn those foundational principles in order to learn about how you can connect it with your everyday life. I would have never imagined majoring in philosophy okay. like that. Would, I did not come into Rockhurst with that intent. And but then because I got that exposure, that's what really brought me into majoring in it. So yeah. I definitely believe that there is some pros there are some cons. But I think it's also comes down to a student being willing and being open to learning it. Yeah, you've confirmed my, my belief, so I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> I went to a school where I basically had no electives for two years. It was all core. Uh, and, wow. and that may be overdoing it, but I loved it. And then when I started making decisions for myself, I screwed it up. I didn't make good decisions. I took better courses in my first two than my final two. Um, but I, I would say these days, you probably can't get away doing that. But um, you also have to combine it with um, other things that are not just cognitive, not just above the head or above the shoulders. And so I was at a school in Indiana called Valparaiso, where they read the same philosophic philosophy books, but then they have to put on a musical performance about the ideas they're studying, studying. And so they have to write the script, they have to write the music, they have to perform the music, they have to do the sets. And so as part of their freshman year, they're not only learning ideas, but they're practicing virtues because it's to work as a team of 70 people, you have to put that into practice. And so we, mostly we learn morality in communities. And so if you can study the ideas, but also live them out either through community service or some other way, then that the body, the information is not just in the mind, it's in the body. Well, that's a classical liberal arts education. You have to demonstrate what you learn and to yeah. give you a stage so that the others can see that you're processing things that bring them to life. Yeah. That's, that's powerful. That's good. Yeah. I'm afraid we're about out of time, Melody, unfortunately, but uh, thank you for giving us this forum. You probably want to drink water or something before you have to go to your next uh, gig, but uh, we sure do appreciate you coming in. Uh, Brianna, do you have any uh, final uh, uh, last words or last comment or question for David? I would just like to say thank you for your time. I believe that um, what you talked about confirmed a lot of my ideas as well. And what I really appreciate is that the world that we live in, we're not indiv individuals in a sense, like we're working in towards a common goal. Um, and it's so important to lean on those around you because that's how you really make that true positive impact. Okay. That's and when I'm an old man, I'll be able to say, look, say, uh, you know, the healthcare system is a lot more equitable than it was when I was <laughs> middle age. And I knew her, I knew her back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all have the great potential to make an impact on life. And, and Brianna sends you off into your future this spring. Uh, I hope the years at Rockers were very valuable to you and that you can look back uh, later and, and, and say that there was something that you garnered here mm -hmm. that is going to impact you later on. Oh, yes. And, and David, again, just want to thank you for uh, saying yes to Rockhurst and coming back to Kansas City. I know you were here a few years ago and probably uh, more often than that. But uh, anyway, it's great to have you here. And I know for a Rockhurst family, just what a great value it is to call us to what we are truly about, which is to be people of virtue and to actualize the, 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 
the character uh, of the divine that is placed within each of us. So I'll, I'll pray for you and thank the thank good you. Lord for you being here and ask that uh, we uh, move forward in, in God's grace. Mm-hmm.